Um, uh, uh, in particular, we learned three different ways to perform a t-test. Uh, they are, of, of course, equivalent to each other. The first way is very straightforward way, basically calculate the t-ratio. Uh, beta hat divided by standard error, so that get the t-ratio, compare t-ratio versus uh, 1.96, roughly speaking. So uh, this is the most straightforward way, easy way, but... Uh, uh, the drawback is 1.96, not precise. In other words, if you want to find the, the precise cutting off value, as you have to check out by using a, either computer or either use a T-table. So this is the first way. Second way, second way we use the p-value reported by computer. Whenever we, the, we find the T-ratio by using computer, computer always report the p-value correspondingly so that if we have a small p-value, how small is small, smaller than 0 0.05, right? So that if you have a small p, then we reject it now. The third way is we calculate the so-called CI, CI range. And it's a lower bound, upper bound. And so the formula looks uh, uh, symmetric, in other words, minus something, plus something. So that this uh, CI range is going to be centered at beta hat because beta hat minus something, beta hat plus something, right? So that as a two sides of a beta hat. So that the usage of this CI range is most likely, or 95% chance, the true beta should locate within this CI range. So that once we have the CI range, so that I can answer whatever test you want me to do. For example, if you want me to test, uh, is it possible that true beta is a zero? then I basically check out this CI range covers a zero or not. For example, suppose my CI is say, from say negative one to positive one, right? Then zero, of course, are inside of my CI. Then basically my answer is say, yes, it is possible the true beta is a zero, right? Similarly, you know, if you ask me to do, uh, to test if it is possible true beta is a positive two, since uh, for example, again, Suppose my CI is between negative one to positive one. Two is outside of my CI, right? So my answer basically, you know, basically no. Uh, oh, basically, there's no chance to for the true beta to be positive two, right? Strictly speaking, I shouldn't say no chance. Uh, the chance will be smaller than 5%, right? Almost no chance, <laughs> smaller than 5%. Similarly, if you ask me, is it possible the true beta is a negative three? Again. You know, three is outside of the range, negative one to positive one, right? So again, I have, you know, almost no chance for the true beta to be negative three, right? So the beauty of uh, CI confidence interval is uh, if I calculate the CI range, I can test whatever, you know, test you want me to do, right? <laughs> no matter beta is uh, true beta is zero, true beta is positive three, negative two, whatever test you want me to do, right? In short, Especially, especially for, for zero. If a zero is outside of my CI, then I reject a null, right? And then, you know, there's no chance that true beta is a zero, right? That's the usage of the CI. Since uh, these three uh, should be equivalent to each other, no matter which one, no matter which one you use, they should, you should get exactly the same result. Uh, let me show you some detail about this uh, uh, p-value, t-value, so on and so forth. In class, we call it a T-ratio or P-value. And so the corresponding relationship are, are right, something like this. For example, this is a normal distribution. This is a normal distribution. So in my graph, the cutting off value right here, I draw 1.96, 1.96. So that very close to two, right? So that's the idea, uh, T-ratio, cutting off value. As P-value will be, the shaded error in my graph, it's the light blue color. Shaded error, of course, uh, for both sides. For example, if you use a cutting off value 1.96, then I have, a, I have a draw a line at a positive 1.96. Similarly, I draw a line at negative 1.96, right? So the shaded error right here and a plus shaded error right here. In other words, since it's a symmetric, you can call it two times the shaded error, right? So the shaded error, they two together, will be 5%. In other words, altogether, altogether, everything underneath the bell-shaped curve will be one. Then the shaded error 
for my light blue color, it will be 5%, which is a 0 0.05, right? So that's the corresponding relationship. That's why 1.96 in turn, you know, corresponding to the shaded area, 5% p-value, right? Similarly, for example, if you try different value, let's say, suppose I try different value, say, uh, let me try, try something like uh, one, roughly speaking, one. Then, then I use a cutting off of value one, the t, t ratio will be one. Then the p-value p value will be larger. Shaded error will be larger. Again, if I try some number smaller than 1.96, say one, right? Which is closer to, the, to zero, right? Then correspondingly, my shaded error right here will be larger than before, larger than 1.96. In my case, p-value will be 0 0.31, right? And so similarly, if you try a very large, somewhere right here, say for example, if I try t ratio is a 2.89, somewhere even further, right? For even further from zero, then the corresponding shaded error will be much smaller. Light, light blue right here, right? And also light blue right here, right? So that the p-value, they two together, will be very small. Right here, print out p-value almost as zero, right? Almost as zero. So the corresponding relationship is, um, you know, a large p-ratio going to correspond to a small p-value. A large t-ratio means, means my t value right here is far away from the center zero, right? So that if I'm far away from the center, then the shaded error right here will be very small, right? <laughs> That's why from method number one, we use a large t, you know, or not to make our decision. How large is large? If a larger than 1.96, right? It means our, our value is kind of far away from the center, right? That's why from the method number one, we use the T ratio if it is larger than 1.96 to make decision, right? So if your if your T ratio is larger than 1.96, one, um, my fat finger. Yeah. <laughs> if it's larger than 1.96, it means I'm far away from the center zero, right? So that's why method number one. I use uh, the T ratio compared with what is 1.96 to make decision. If it's larger than 1.96, my conclusion is, uh, okay, my true beta is far away from center zero, right? As method number two, equivalently, we use p-value to make decision. As if our p-value is small, how small is small? Smaller than 0 0.05, right? Where does the number 0 0.05 come from? It's because for the cutting off value 1.96, then the shaded error right here, there will be 5%, 0 0.05, right? So that, so that if my if I t ratio is large somewhere around here, then the p-value will be small, smaller than 0 0.05, right? The further I got my, you know, the larger the t ratio I got, the smaller the both tails, the shaded error it will be, right? That's why a large t corresponding to a small p, right? A large t corresponding to a small p. That's why in method number one, if you get a large t, then we reject it now. Method number two, if you get a small p, we reject it now. They're equivalent to each other. Both of them indicates we are far away from the center zero, right? And that's basically the corresponding relationship. And so, and so that's basically the idea. Uh, by the way, this graph, uh, this graph, I wrote to the codes by using command manipulate, so that so that uh, in our graph we can we can try different numbers to to see what happens to our graph. And so, <laughs> and so if you're interested in this, I, I can post the codes on Canvas so that you can see later on. And so, actually, I have codes for other. Let me show this one as well. Uh, just now, the graph is for normal distribution. This is a bell-shaped curve. This is a normal distribution, right? And so what's the difference between a t-distribution and a normal distribution? 
Do you guys uh, remember? Did you teach her? Teach her? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Almost, almost. <laughs> You're right. You're correct. Basically, you know, t distribution slightly different from normal because uh, sample size. But how different? Or you know, for different sample size, uh, what slightly is that fatter or thinner? So, so, what does it exactly look like? Let me show you. And so this is my codes for T distribution. So right here, uh, my black curve, my black solid line is a standard normal dis distribution. Standard normal means a center to be zero. The variance is one, right? And my blue, oh no, red <laughs> broken line is a T distribution with a degree freedom of one. So that you can see, first of all, you know, T distribution, the, the, the red color one, is also symmetric, also bell-shaped, right? But it's, it's a little bit lower. It's a, bit, a little bit uh, fatter, right? Something like slightly different. It's, uh, this is for degree freedom of one. How about degree freedom of two? How about degree free freedom of three, so on so first? And so let's make it a little bit bigger, two. So, did you see the change? And so it's a slightly change, slightly taller, the T distribution. Let me increase a little by little so that you can focus on this graph to see what happens when I increase the degree of freedom. See, the red curve increasing and increasing, right? So that when I degree freedom increase, eventually, for example, increase to 30, the my T distribution almost exactly is the same as that normal, right? So, so first of all, a T distribution that depends on degree of freedom. T distribution has a degree of freedom. Normal dis distribution doesn't have those kind of a de degree of freedom. It's that always a normal, you know, centered uh, zero, center at zero, variance to be one. The T distribution depends on the degree of freedom. Hence, when the T distribution when degree of freedom getting big, larger and larger, eventually, when degree of freedom goes to infinity, then the T distribution become exactly the same as a normal. And so, in other in other words, and so, in other words, normal distribution could be viewed as a special case of a T distribution with degree freedom of infinity. <laughs> right <laughs> again if t distribution with an infinity degree freedom they become exactly the same as normal right that's why the the normal distribution could be viewed as a special case of t t distribution with a degree freedom of uh, infinity right <laughs> that's why that's why in our case there's a 1.96 the cutting off value just now i showed you the cutting off value 1.96 based on our normal distribution, right? In other words, when our sample size n is really, really large, then the cutting off value, you, you know, you can, you can, you know, you can find it from a normal distribution, which is at 1.96, right? But in, in finite example, in other words, in reality, depends on our sample size. Suppose our sample size is not that large. Suppose our degree of freedom, which is n minus k, right? Suppose not that large, for example, only 30, only 20, only 10, right? So on so forth. Then the t distribution will be slightly different from normal distribution. So that the corresponding cutting off value may not be exactly 1.96. It will be actually larger than 1.96, something like 1.97, 1.98, so on so forth. Depends on your degree of freedom, right? Usually slightly larger. <laughs> and so that's the idea you know, T distribution, normal distribution, sounds the first. Uh, so in my example, when, when degree freedom is uh, 30, the T distribution become almost the same as normal, right? T distribution almost the same as normal. That's why, that's why in your 
uh, statistics textbook before, <laughs> there's something like then in simple size is more than thirty. <laughs> then you know <laughs> you can you can roughly speaking use a t you use a normal distribution. You basically use a one point eight six as a cutting off value, right? And so simple size less than thirty, you have to find the precise cutting off value. That's basically uh, why do you have those kind of conclusion in your statistics book have you had before? <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, mm -hmm. that's what we learned uh, last time. Today, let's continue to introduce something uh, in chapter th chapter three. This is not in Bataji's textbook. Bataji's textbook slightly, you know, mentioned it, but not in this detail. But 